Now, we thank you again for coming. We are going to continue in this series, which is um, studies in Revelation chapters 1 to 3. Uh, we've entitled it Letters from Heaven. I was thinking about this, and I thought, well, it's a bit misleading, because it seems as though the rest of the letters in the New Testament are not letters from heaven. Well, of course they are. All the Bible is from heaven. It's all from God. But in a special way, I suppose, we have messages from the risen Christ, the ascended Christ, through John to different churches in the book of Revelation. And that's what our study is going to be over the next few months, Lord willing. Let me just recap a little bit. Last month, we said that the book of Revelation is a difficult book. Uh, It is a difficult book to read, a difficult book to understand, but the key to it perhaps is found in chapter 1, verse 19. The Lord Jesus says to John, I want you to write three things. First of all, the things that you've seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. So immediately you've got this threefold division of the book. The things which thou hast seen. In chapter 1, the Lord Jesus had just appeared in a vision to John. And he saw the Lord Jesus walking in the golden, uh, among the golden lampstands. And that covers the things that you've just seen. Write about these things. That's chapter 1. And then the things which are. Uh, the Lord Jesus had messages to John to give to the churches that existed in Asia at that time. So that covers chapters 2 to 3. And then chapter 4 onwards deals with the things which shall be hereafter. So you have got this vision in chapter 1. And you've got the letters in chapters 2 and 3. And then chapter 4 is a new beginning. John is caught up to heaven in chapter 4. And he sees unfolding before him the program of the future. Thankfully we're not dealing with that part tonight. uh, And in this series because it's a very complicated section. But we're dealing with the section in chapters 2 to 3. We did say that in chapters 1 to 3 we have the Lord's government in the churches. And then chapter 4 to the end the Lord's government in the world. In other words, God at the moment is dealing, the Lord Jesus is dealing with his churches. The day is coming when he's going to step in and start to deal in government with the world. People sometimes say, why doesn't God do something? God is going to do something. Sadly, it's not what people want sometimes, but God is going to step in in our world and sort things out, basically, and bring about his great plan that Christ will be all. And God will be all in all. So that gives us a kind of key to the book of Revelation. We, we, we saw last month, let's just recap, that last month we looked at chapter 1 and we saw this vision. The Lord Jesus appears to John in a way he'd never seen him before. We, we looked at that and he's moving in the middle of seven lampstands. These lampstands represent the local churches in Asia. And we did suggest that this is a scene from the temple, really, in the Old Testament. It's a picture from the temple where the priests would go around trimming the lamps, making sure the lamps were burning properly, cleaning them, taking off the old wicks and so on, making sure they're full of oil. This is really what the Lord Jesus is doing uh, in the churches. He's going around attending to each one, making sure the light is burning brightly. And that's really the key to chapters 2 and 3, these letters. This is how he does it. This is how he makes sure the lamp's burning brightly, by addressing these different churches. And that's what we're going to think about this evening. So when we come into chapters 2 and 3, here is a picture of John. And he is an aged man. He's the last apostle, probably in his 90s at this stage. He is the last surviving apostle. The, The others have all gone. And John is in exile on the Isle of Patmos. And he sees this wonderful vision and the Lord Jesus says, now, I want you to write this book and I want you to write letters to seven churches which are in Asia. And this is what we're going to look at this evening and in the coming months, God willing. Uh, Let me just quickly run through the different features of these churches. The first one is Ephesus. We're going to think about that tonight. We're going to talk about that as the formal church. We're going to see that as we look at the detail. The second one is Smyrna, which is the suffering church. These were people being persecuted. The Lord Jesus has a special message for them. Thirdly, Pergamos. This was a church that had compromised with the world. And the Lord Jesus had some very straight things to say to Pergamos and also to Thyatira, number four, which had allowed elements of paganism to come into the church. And Sardis, 
Uh, the Lord Jesus says that you have a name that you live, but you're actually dead. In other words, they were trading on the reputation, and it sounded great, but actually it was lifeless. So it was a lifeless church. Philadelphia, there's a, a gleam of hope here. Number six, it's the evangelistic church. The Lord Jesus says, I've set before you an open door. It's an open door of opportunity. And this church is faithful to the Lord and trying to go through this door and to evangelize. And then sadly, we come to number seven, Laodicea. You remember the Lord Jesus says to Laodicea, you're neither hot nor cold. You're neither one thing nor the other. And it was a lukewarm church. It was an apostate church. And the Lord Jesus was actually outside. Instead of being inside, he was outside. And sometimes we use that verse, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And we apply it in the gospel and we say to unconverted people, The Lord Jesus is knocking outside your heart and he wants to come in. That's quite true. But in actual fact, it's written to Christians. The Lord Jesus is outside and he is knocking. And it's a sad state of affairs. These are the main features of the seven churches. We did mention last month that it has been suggested some teachers believe that these seven churches give us a kind of panoramic view of the whole church age. So right from the apostolic church right through to the apostate church at the end. Uh, That's a very interesting thing. We're not going to think about that too detail in too much detail tonight. But it is interesting to see that there seems to be features of these churches that correspond with what we might call church history through our age. So to begin with, there was a time of the apostolic church, John's the last apostle at Ephesus, and then it moves through times of persecution and then times of unfaithfulness and times of mixture of pagan and Christian things and then you get uh, things like the Protestant Reformation and so on until you get to the last one which is the apostate church and sadly we're maybe not too far away from that as we stand today. So it is an interesting picture, a possibility, uh, a panorama of the church age. But we're going to think tonight, after all that introduction, about Ephesus. So let's turn in our Bibles, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 2. If you've got a Bible with you, if you haven't, your neighbour might have one. Chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, and reading from verse 1. We're going to read the first seven verses. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, the Lord Jesus is speaking, These things saith he who holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks or lampstands. I know thy works, and thy labour, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast laboured, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Amen. So here is the first letter. It's addressed to the church at Ephesus. The church at Ephesus was an interesting church. It had been, Ephesus had been evangelized by Paul. We read about this in the book of the Acts. He had spent an extended period of about two years teaching the Christians. I think that would have been a privilege. It would be nice to hear Paul teaching, wouldn't it? And not only had he given them his oral ministry, but he had written to them. And we have preserved in the Bible the letter to the Ephesians. And most theologians agree that what Paul talks about in the letter to the Ephesians is almost the climax of Christian revelation. He's talking about very, very rarefied doctrine, very high, elevated truths. Uh, It's also, I haven't put it up on the screen, but it was also held by tradition that John was based in Ephesus. 
until he was exiled to Patmos. So if that's the case, this must have been a wonderful church to be in. Founded by the Apostle Paul when he came and preached the gospel. Taught and discipled by the Apostle Paul over two years preaching. And then to receive a letter from the Apostle Paul that is part of the word of God. And then possibly to have the presence of the last of the apostles. You imagine that. You imagine going up to John after a meeting like this and saying, John, tell me, what was the Lord Jesus really like? That's what I'd have asked him anyway. What was it like to lean on the Lord Jesus on his breast at supper? And, and uh, what, what are your impressions looking back now on what the Lord Jesus... Well, I think it must have been wonderful. Uh, what I'm trying to say is this. The church at Ephesus was a greatly privileged church. I was at a talk last night about revivals in Scotland. And the speaker said, he's written a book about this, and he said that possibly no other country in the world has had the number of revivals, seasons of blessing, privileges in terms of the word of God being available than Scotland has. Sorry for the English folks here. But the point is this. This church was greatly privileged, but it had a real problem. And we're going to discover what that is. Uh, this evening. This letter covers the first seven verses of chapter 2, and I just want to highlight the things the Lord Jesus speaks about. There are six things. First of all, in verse 1, he greets them and he describes himself. He says to the church at Ephesus, and then he describes himself. And if you're uh, remembering the vision of chapter 1, you'll know that every time the Lord Jesus describes himself, he draws from this vision in chapter 1. So in chapter 1, John sees this person, the Son of Man, walking in the middle of the candlesticks, and he's got seven stars in his hand. That's how the Lord Jesus describes himself to the church at Ephesus. We're going to discover why. Secondly, in the next section, verses 2 and 3, we have a list of things that the Lord approved of, the things that he commended in this church. As the Lord looked on the church, there were many things that he was pleased with. And we're going to think about these. But then the third part is that in verses 4 to 5, the Lord says, I have, however, got something against you. And the Lord puts his finger on a problem in the church. And he's calling them to deal with this problem. We're going to have to look at that. Uh, the fourth section deals with a mysterious group of people called the Nicolaitans. <laughs> well, we must have a look at them and see who they are. And then fifthly, and this is common to all the letters, the Lord appeals and says, anyone who's got ears to hear, let him hear. And then finally, in this section, and in every letter, the Lord Jesus says, now, if anyone overcomes, in other words, He's, he's looking for individuals, and this comes right down to us today. He's looking for individuals who will take on board what he is saying and will enact what he's saying. And he gives them an incentive. He talks about, if you overcome, you will get this and you will get that and you'll be blessed and this will happen and so on. And so he talks about the reward for the overcomer. So let's just go down through this very briefly and simply this evening and see what the Lord Jesus has in his mind and what he wants to convey to the church at Ephesus. Well, first of all, let's start with the greeting and description of verse 1. Look at verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the middle of the golden lampstands. So first of all, he holds the seven stars in his right hand. Now, we did talk about the seven stars. The seven stars represent the seven angels. Uh, that doesn't make us any wiser because we think, well, who are these angels? Are they actual angels? Are they men? Is it a representation of the church? Is it simply the messenger who took the letter back to the church? Because the word is the same, messenger and angels, the same. However you understand the, the stars, what this picture is telling us is that he is holding the stars in his right hand. It is a place of security and safety. And there's a wonderful verse in Jude, the smallest uh, book in the New Testament, that says, Unto him, it's a doxology, who is able to keep us from falling. Now just look down at verse 5. 
Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. So here is an appropriate figure for this church because this church is a fallen church. They didn't think they were fallen, but they were. But the Lord Jesus is reminding them that there's no need for them to fall because he holds them in his right hand. Now, if you remember John's Gospel, you remember John chapter 10? Those of us who are farming people and uh, live in the countryside will remember that John 10 is all about the sheep and the shepherd. And the Lord Jesus says, I give unto my sheep eternal life and they will never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So it's interesting that here John is writing again about the Lord Jesus. It's not sheep in his hand, it's stars in his hand. And however you understand that, brothers and sisters, let us remember this, that we are absolutely secure and safe in the hands of Christ. That's why we open with the hymn, O love that will not let me go. The Lord Jesus has a problem with this church. It's a problem of love. Not his love for them, but their love for him. But his love for them has never changed. And it's wonderful to remember that. Then he describes himself as the one who walks in the middle of the golden lampstands. And this reminds us that each church, each local church, these are represented by lampstands, is directly accountable to him. We talked about this last week. The headquarters is not in Edinburgh, it's not in Rome, it's not in Canterbury. The headquarters of the church is in heaven. And the headquarters of this local church is in heaven. And the Christians who meet in this local church and in any local church are responsible directly to him. And he is fully aware of what is going on. He's in the midst of them. He's very close to them. And it reminds us too that what happened in the local church matters to him. You cannot read these chapters without realizing that the Lord Jesus is very interested in what happens in your local church. And he's moving in the middle of these golden candlesticks. And that's how the Lord describes himself. Just remember too that when you think of stars, you're thinking of heavenly light. And when you think of lampstands, you're thinking of earthly light. And so there is a kind of correspondence with heaven and earth. And I would put it like this, that there is a cooperation between heaven and earth. Have you ever thought of that? That the local church should be an outpost of heaven. That it should be, just as the stars in heaven are shining brightly, so the lampstand on earth should be shining brightly. So I think that's symbolized in this description. Let's move on now to what the Lord commands. Things that the Lord approves of. I remember being in a, in a conference once and there's a, there's a passage in the, in the Old Testament, the book of Proverbs, there are seven things the Lord hates. It's very interesting. You look it up when you get home. Seven things the Lord hates. And the preacher went down seven things the Lord hates. And he spoke later on and he spoke about seven things the Lord loves. Well, I'm going to just point out that there are seven features that the Lord Jesus approves of in this church. And let's just ask ourselves, are they present in our local church? First of all, he says in verse 2, I know thy works. In other words, this was an active church. They weren't just passive. They weren't just coming, uh, attending services, sitting in the seats and going home. They were an active church. If you had been there when the announcements were read out in Ephesus, you'd be staggered at what they were doing. Because they were working. They were doing things. And the Lord Jesus says, I know all about it. That's quite comforting, isn't it? You know, sometimes things that we do get great publicity. Sometimes we think nobody notices what I do. Well, somebody notices what you do. And that's the Lord. And the Lord says, I know what you're doing. And I approve of it. You're an active church. And I sometimes think that uh, if all the Christians, and I, I include myself, if we were active in good works and in, in reaching out and spreading the gospel and showing kindness and displaying Christ, what a difference it would make in the whole community. Well, they were very active in Ephesus. I'm sure people in Ephesus knew about the Christians. They were very active and noted for good works. And then he uses the word, I know thy labor. And the word for labor is a very strong word. It really means almost working to the point of exhaustion. I, I, I maybe done that once or twice in my life, I think, physically, I mean. Uh, sometimes you work. Uh, I remember we were in Finland once and we were helping somebody take their harvest. And I've never worked so hard in my life. 
thought I was going to die. But uh, that was just me. But the Lord Jesus is saying, it's not just doing things, but you're putting everything into it. You're putting energy into it. Isn't it nice when there are Christians? And I know that we, we, we can't all do everything. And we can't be involved in everything. But it's nice when Christians are energetic Christians, as far as they can be and what they can do. And so that's what they were. Second great feature. The third is, he says, I know your works and I know your labor and I know your patience. I know that you're taking the long view. You know, sometimes we are very short-sighted. Well, the Lord Jesus commended this church because they were patient. And if you read through the Bible, you'll find again and again the, 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 the scriptures enjoin us to be patient. We're so impatient. And possibly even more so now that we've got the internet. You know, something takes a few minutes to come up and we're just, come on, you know, we can't wait. Well, in Christian things, we've got to learn that God is working for eternity, not for the next five minutes. God is taking the long view and so should we. And so don't be discouraged. And the Lord is saying to the Ephesians, they weren't discouraged. They were working, they were putting it all into it and they were patient. They were, they were leaving it to God. Sometimes, and I have to say it myself, we get impatient. You, you hold services and you do tracting and you try to, and you think, why is nothing happening? Just be patient. Just be patient. Leave it in God's hands. That's what they were doing. And then, listen to this one. The Lord Jesus commends these Christians for their intolerance. <laughs> well, this is incredible, isn't it, today? You know, that's one, there is one thing that is worshipped in the world or supposedly worshipped in the world today and that is tolerance we must tolerate everything we must tolerate every view every lifestyle everything that goes around we must tolerate it all that's a great mark of a christian if you can tolerate anything not at all the lord jesus said i want to commend you for your intolerance look at what he says in verse 2 how thou canst not bear. That's a very strong word. Thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not. And hast found them liars. So they are intolerant of two things. They are intolerant of evil. And they are intolerant of doctrinal evil. So there's moral evil. And there's doctrinal evil. Now let me just say something very clear here. We live in a society where every kind of lifestyle is supposed to be accepted. Now when it comes to the local church, we have to be intolerant of evil. That means that we love people. And we reach out to people. We treat people all the same. It doesn't matter what your lifestyle is. But when it comes to the local church, we cannot tolerate certain lifestyles and let me just say it straight for the record the christian church is not a place for homosexuality or gay lifestyles that doesn't mean people aren't welcome to come to our services of course they are but we cannot endorse lifestyles that are evil the lord jesus says i commend you for your intolerance of evil and then he says, not only moral evil, but doctrinal evil. You've tried those who are apostles, you've tested them, and you've found that they're not apostles, and you have exercised your judgment, your discernment. Sometimes I think that we're so naive as Christians. Somebody comes along and says, I've seen a vision, I've done something, I've, I've got some revelation, and we just open our mouths and swallow it all. Well, we need to be believing, we need to be trusting, but we don't need to be foolish and naive. And it's interesting. If John was at Ephesus, he's the last apostle. And now John's gone, there are people coming along and saying, well, I'm an apostle too. And the Ephesians have got some sense and they test them and realize they're not apostles at all. You remember when Paul, in chapter 20 of the book of the Acts, Paul called for the, Eph the elders of Ephesus and he said, now after I go away, people will try to come in and try to upset you and try to, they're like wolves coming into a flock of sheep. He said, I want you to be in your guard. And they were. And so the Lord Jesus says, I want to commend you for your works, for your labor, for your patience, for your intolerance of evil. And I want to commend you because you're doing heavy lifting. He says, you have borne, you've been, you've been bearing burdens. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Because uh, the Bible says, bear each other's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. So they were bearing with each other. 
you know, some of the difficulties in local churches come because of personalities, don't they? And we need to exercise a lot of grace with each other. We don't always act in the same way. We don't see things always in the same way. Our personalities can rub each other up a little bit, but they bear with each other. And so the Lord Jesus commends them. This is a lovely church to be in, isn't it? And then the Lord speaks about, you have borne and you've had patience and for my name's sake you've laboured. So this is the idea of my name's sake. They had a clear testimony in Ephesus. People knew that they were Christians, that they represented Christ, and that's what the local church is all about. We're not representing a denomination. We're not trying to represent some kind of lifestyle. Every local church is here to represent Christ. And it's for my name's sake. And it's quite sad that different groups of believers and Christians down through the ages have taken different names to try and badges to put on themselves and all the time we're supposed to be it's the name of Christ. He is the one to be exalted. They had a clear testimony. And then he said, you have not fainted. You've got stamina. One of the easy things in the Christian life is to start something and then not finish it. It's to be enthusiastic at the beginning and just lose interest eventually. Well, the Ephesian Christians, they were marked by endurance and spiritual stamina. You might be thinking that's the perfect church. You might be thinking, what a, what a lovely church this would be. Imagine them, founded by the Apostle Paul, taught by Paul, having this letter to the Ephesians, and the Lord commends them in glowing terms, seven wonderful features that he could say about this church. And I would say, I want to join this church. But the Lord Jesus says, now, hold on. This church was facing extinction. There was the real possibility it could cease to exist for one reason. The Lord Jesus says, I have somewhat against thee. Look at verse 4. Nevertheless, despite all that, I have somewhat against thee because you have left your first love. Now let's just pause a minute. Brothers and sisters, and think about this. You've left your first love. What does this mean? Well, some believe that it means that the Lord is saying, when you were first converted, you had a great love for me. You really loved me. That moment you trusted me to be a savior, you love me, but you don't love me as much now as you did then. It's first, because that was the first love you had for me when you were first converted. Others take the view, and I tend to take the second view, that it's not so much in terms of time, but it's in terms of quality. First love. It's the quality. They had a pure, at one point, they had a pure love for the Savior. And the Lord Jesus is saying, you've got all the externals, you're busy, you're active, you're you're a great church, everybody knows about you, but I can see into the heart of the members of this church and I can tell that they've left the first love. And that tells me this, dear friends, that no amount of orthodoxy, activity, or zeal can compensate for a lack of love to Christ. I find that very challenging. It's easy to get involved in church activities. It's easy to be at all the different services and, and, and to try and put everything into things, but We can be going on with all that and very active, and I'm speaking to myself here, but at the same time we can be quite cold in our love for Christ. I just want to think of one or two causes why that might be. Well, I think a lot of it comes from this, that there can be a lack of occupation with Christ. A lack of reading and prayer and meditation. I'm I'm just speaking from my own experience because I have to confess this. That there are times you feel that your heart is so cold. Wonder if you love the Lord at all. And, and the Lord is saying, you once loved me with a pure love, a high love, a quality love, your first love. And now you've left that, you've slipped from that. And it can be simply because I'm so busy and I'm so active that I've lost my focus on Christ. And then secondly, linked to that is, I have a diminished appreciation of the Lord and his work. It's very difficult to tell somebody to love someone, isn't it? You can't force people to love somebody. But I'll tell you this, if you appreciate someone, if you think, that person, you were singing a hymn on Sunday, I was quite moved by it when we were singing it, 
he lives, he lives. And one of the lines goes like this. No other friend so tender, so kind and good as he. I was thinking, that's, that's really true. You think of your best friend. You think of your closest friend. And, and the hymn writer is saying, there is nobody closer and better. There's no friend better than him. And, and I think, looking into my own heart, I begin to get cold in heart when I fail to appreciate just how wonderful the Lord Jesus is, just how loving he is, just how kind he is, just how good he is. And, and then sometimes we love people because of what they do. And when I get away from the cross, we were singing at the weekend, Jesus keep me near the cross. When I, when I forget, or, or at least I don't appreciate what the Saviour has done for me, then I find my heart getting cold. And so these can be causes. And thirdly, there can be a displacement. Something else can come in that can take the place the Lord should have in my heart. And so maybe there's something else that suddenly is more important and it's taking up more of my attention, more of my thoughts. And I find that I'm not thinking about the Lord as much as I should. And I'm not, I'm not meditating on him because something else is keeping, keeping that place that should be reserved for him. It's very interesting. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, this very church, and he said, my prayer for you is that Christ will dwell in your heart by faith. And the word for dwell is that Christ may make his home in your heart. That's interesting, isn't it? And so it's possible that we can displace the Lord. Sometimes difficulties, disappointments, trials can cause us to lose our love for the Lord. You know, life can be hard. It can deal with some bitter blows. As Christians, we go through trials and difficulties. That can cause us to lose our love for the Lord. And there can be the deadening influence of the world. And so this is a model church. An active church. But the Lord Jesus says, you've left your first love. And I wonder, as I look into my own heart, what is my love for the Lord? Has it been, can I look back to days when it was better, when I'd have done anything for the Lord? If the Lord had told me to, to jump, I'd have said, how high? I'd have done anything for him. And now maybe it's not quite like that. Well, the Lord says, you've left your first love. But there's a, there's a, a call to repent. There are three instructions given very briefly. The Lord Jesus says, remember. Remember, he says in verse 5, remember from whence you're fallen and repent. This is definite action involving a change of attitude. He's asking, this is not sinners needing to repent to become Christians. These are Christians who need to repent. They need to change their lifestyle. They need to change their attitude. And so the Lord is calling them to remember better days, happier days. He's calling them to repent and he's calling them to return and to do the first works. And these are works, I suggest, that spring from this first love, this quality of love. And so the Lord is, is appealing to them not to stay at a distance from him, but to come closer, to remember, to repent and to return to the first works. And then he has a warning. He says, unless or else, verse 5, I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy lampstand out of his place except thou repent. In other words, the Lord is saying, if you don't uh, repent of this coldness towards me, then I will remove the lampstand. That might mean that the church ceases to exist. It may mean that it's no longer a faithful representation of the Lord. It may mean that it ceases to be a light bearer in Ephesus. But the Lord is saying, this calls for drastic action. And so here's a formal church. They're going on with all the outward show, but inside things are not quite right as they should be. That's a very challenging thing for me, I find. Let's briefly go on to the next section. The Nicolaitans. The Lord Jesus says, But this thou hast, verse 6, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. You know, I wondered, why does the Lord leave this, leave this separate from the things that he commends them for? He could have included this in the list of things that he was pleased about. But then he tells them about the love, how the love has failed. And I think it's because he's contrasting their love and their hate. He says, there's nothing wrong with your hatred. It's your love that I'm concerned about. 
And the Lord says, this you have, this is your, uh, to be commended, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Did you ever think of the Lord Jesus hating things? Sometimes we've got such a, a wishy-washy picture of the Lord that we think that the Lord just loves everything and all kinds of behaviour. The Lord says, there are certain things I hate and I'm glad that you hate them too. So we better ask ourselves, well, who are these Nicolaitans? Well, there are a couple of, there are many theories about them, but I'll just give you two which are possibilities. One is, perhaps they were a sect formed by Nicholas of Antioch, uh, reputedly combining outward orthodoxy with immoral, licentious behaviour. So basically, it's suggested that there was this sect, the Nicolaitans, followers of Nicholas, who had this outward form of piety, and orthodoxy, but they practiced all kinds of immoralities and so on. Now that might be the case. The difficulty with this is there's very little historical evidence that this actually happened. There is a man called Nicholas of Antioch, he's mentioned I think in the book of the Acts, but he's been pinned on with this reputation. I think there'll be a few Bible commentators who have to apologize to him when they get to heaven if he's there. Because uh, because the Bible doesn't say this, but it's a possibility that there was somebody like Nicholas who had this kind of Doctrine. The other meaning which a number of commentators favour is the word Nicolaitans means power over the people or the victorious people. And some see in this the beginnings of what we might call priestcraft and the ecclesiastical systems. So they suggest that by the very name that is used, the very meaning of the word, that this could be the beginning of people beginning to elevate themselves above the Christians and dominate the Christians. And church history shows us that that is exactly what happened. It's interesting that John, in his letters, I think it's his last letter he writes, and he speaks about a man in the church who loves to have the preeminence. Now, he wants to be number one all the time. We're going to watch that. We're going to watch that. And, and possibly this is the idea, and, and some have suggested, these people are taking a place that really belongs to the Lord Jesus alone. And that's why the Lord is so strong in his condemnation of the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now, it's difficult to say, possibly I lean towards the second opinion. The interesting thing is here that in this verse, they're spoken of as the deeds of the Nicolaitans. If you just look down to verse 15, the Lord Jesus, in the same chapter, he's addressing the church at Pergamos, and he says, So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So not only are there deeds, they're acts, but it's been formalized into a doctrine. And that's sometimes what happens. Behavior drives doctrine. It's, be- it's become a system of, of doctrine. The Lord Jesus says, I don't like this at all. In fact, I hate it. And I'm glad that you hate it as well. Let me just give you a quotation from Tim LaHaye. Do you know Tim LaHaye? He wrote a number of books, uh, including the Left Behind series, which some of you might know about. He says, and I just quote his words, the single greatest curse in modern Christendom is ecclesiasticism. When men get control of spiritual training of other people and are in a position to dominate the church, their theological position will eventually dominate that church. The history of the Church of Jesus Christ is a continuous cycle of autonomous churches amalgamating into great conventions of denominations of ecclesiastical hierarchies that eventually become apostate. A lot of big words there. But what he's basically saying is that the history of the church shows that what started off very simply as just local congregations responsible to the Lord eventually developed into big ecclesiastical hierarchies with men in positions of authority and dominating these churches and eventually these systems become apostate, which is what we're going to think about in the church at Laodicea. So very solemn thing and it gives us cause to just stand back and see how far have we drifted perhaps in our perception of what a church should be from the simplicity of the New Testament. And possibly the Nicolaitans are involved in this kind of thing. I'm bringing this very quickly to close. The Lord's appeal in verse 7. He says, He that hath an ear, has anyone got an ear? Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Just a few things about this. It's a very wide scope. The Lord isn't saying, this is a message for the elders of the church. He's not saying, this is a message for the Bible teachers in the church. He's saying, if anyone's got an ear, have you got an ear to hear? Can you hear my voice? Anyone who can hear my voice, he says, 
let him hear. In other words, we're all responsible. You know, sometimes we can duck things a little bit and say, well, the church I go to or the church I'm in or the way that we behave, we've always done it like this. And it's not my problem. It's not my responsibility. I know it's wrong, but, you know, we can't duck it. The Lord Jesus is saying, if, you've got, if you hear my voice, I want you to take action. And each one of us one day will give a, an account, not just as to what we did in our personal lives, but what we did in our church life as well. I believe that. And then secondly, this is just not a natural ear, of course. It's a spiritual, it's spiritual receptiveness. Are we willing to listen? People get the message uh, audibly. They hear, but they don't receive it. They're not really paying attention. They're not, they're not accepting it. And so often we're like that, aren't we? The Lord Jesus says, I, I want you not just to hear my voice. I want you to take action on it. I want you to really hear it and receive it. And then it's what the Spirit says. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit speaks through the Word of God. And the Lord Jesus says, the Spirit says to the churches, not just the church in Ephesus, but all the churches. So here's a message for us all. Finally, let's come to the reward for the overcomer. The Lord Jesus says in verse 7, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life and the paradise of God. What an unusual expression. What an unusual thing. It brings us right back to the Garden of Eden. You remember in the Garden of Eden, there were two trees. There was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were not to eat of that tree. And there was the tree of life. And you know what happened? Adam fell. This is the fallen church. Adam fell and he and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And as a result, they were expelled from the Garden of Eden and they were not allowed to eat of the tree of life. When I was a young Christian, I used to wonder, when I used to think about, people would talk about the end of time, a new heaven and a new earth, and I used to wonder, wouldn't it be dreadful if the whole thing just started again? You know, if we went back to the beginning, maybe I'd just think a strange way, but I just thought, wouldn't it be dreadful if somehow sin came in again, and, and, and this new creation was all spoiled? It wouldn't be, because in the future paradise, there aren't two trees, there's one tree, it's a tree of life. And if we read at the end of this book, in chapter 22, read it when you get home, there's a description of the tree of life in the city that John sees. And he sees this tree of life. Now the interesting thing is this, that the idea of a tree of life appears in all mythologies from India to Scandinavia. In other words, wherever you look at mythology in the world, you'll find invariably there's something about a tree, a tree of life. Why is that? Is it because all religions are heading to the same place? Not at all. It's because all religions ultimately have a memory of what happened right at the beginning. There's a tree of life at the beginning. And it's corrupted in different religions. But they've all got a residual knowledge that there's something called a tree of life. Well, what does this tree of life mean? Well, it is promised to overcomers and a fallen church. Because that takes us back to the fall in the original Garden of Eden. And it's symbolic of spiritual life and nourishment in Christ. It tells us that he will be eternally the portion of his people. In other words, we will enjoy the Saviour throughout eternity. And the Lord is saying, if you overcome, I will promise you that you will eat. Of course, it's not a literal tree. It's not literal fruit. But the Lord is saying, just as there is nothing just quite like fresh, juicy, sweet fruit. It's so lovely. The Lord is saying, you will feast on me. I am the tree of life. Throughout eternity you'll feast on me. And it's very interesting because this imagery is used in the Song of Solomon. You remember the Song of Solomon? The bride says, as the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. And she says, I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. And the Song of Songs is a song of love. That's what this is all about. You've left your first love. The Lord Jesus says, if you get back to your first love, you will enjoy. You will enjoy, possibly here, but certainly in the future. This is a reward held out to those who overcome.